Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 560 freaking eight of the Dead Robot Society. Oh, thank you for saying it that way. Thank you so much. You told me to. I know. <laughs> am I am I giving you looks of daggers or something? That, that no. could have been, you know, reproach in your hey, voice. I don't know. A reproach on my face. <laughs> I'm Terry Mixon. Joining me, Paul E. Cooley. How you doing, man? Apparently, I'm in the grammar uh, police today or something along those lines. Ooh. I don't know. What do the grammar police wear as a uniform? It depends on what you're writing. <laughs> Why do I think BDSM? Ooh. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, the erotica grammar police. I just, wow, the places my brain went. <laughs> There's quite the visual. <laughs> They carry little horse whips. And is that a pronoun ring you're wearing? It's a pro. Uh, never mind. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, okay, I broke Terry. <laughs> Terry. What have you been up to, man? I have been writing. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah, I got a couple more thousand words on Signal Decay, so it's over twenty, and uh, it's made the the transition. <laughs> From, from from thought to possibly novel. From from actual actual story to oh my god, I might actually finish this thing. Actually, Don't believe I'm, it. It's I'm never going to happen. It's it's made where it goes. But this morning I was I was I was making coffee and I went oh that's what's bothering him about that scene I just wrote. It's too soon for that. So I had to push it down a little bit. There's a little more stuff we got to show, and I got to get through another day, another ten thousand words. And the weirdness will start, really start in earnest. So I'm excited. Good I'm deal. Excited. Being excited is very important. Yeah. I'm just pissed because I did not put out a book this year. Um, Bad monkey. Well, I mean, technically, Destruction came, or excuse me, Destruction, Jesus. Technically, the best kind of technical, uh, Evolution came out, the audio this year. Um, so got that done. I finished up some other things that I can't really talk about. Got a couple of stories out and uh, got Trident done. So now I just Trident needs to be put in audio and everything else. But the new book is going real well, and uh, I am very happy so far. Excellent. Yeah, it's always good when you get to put the next uh, word down. But I had a lot of thoughts while I was writing this going, God damn it, I wish I could put that you know, name thing in this story. Oh, okay. I guess I'm going to have to write a similar one. That's not really like this in some other universe and people will say blah, blah, blah. And I won't give a fuck. Cause it's a really cool idea. So um, yeah, that's where things are. Sounds like a, you're in a good place. I got a lot of admin shit. I got to do as far as getting uh LLC up and, and some bills paid and, and uh, yada, but other than that, things are, things are good. So this being, we're recording this on uh, New Year's Eve. Yep. What are your plans for next year? You didn't technically publish anything last year. Correct. So what do you hope to accomplish in the year to come? Finish Signal Decay. Finish, um, finish up Shipyards or finish uh, Extinction. The idea of my real goal of 2020 is to clear the plates of all the black of the, all the severed press properties, get, get them all finished and also get signal decay done. Damn. That sounds ambitious. Well, it's only two books only, uh, but I have a bad feeling extinction is going to turn into something really huge. So <laughs> I've got to kind of watch. That's one of those where I'm going to kind of have to make a decision at some point going, all right, just how fucking crazy would I want this to go? <laughs> uh, it, could t it, it could just be a 100,000 word book, but I doubt it. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be one of those monster movies where you have to show things going wrong in every sector of the city before it all comes together in one explosion of crazy. So I think that's how that, that book is going to go. So we'll see how many words it takes me to get there. <laughs> but shipyards, uh, I've got a really good feeling for what needs to happen there. I have a really good feeling for how it's going to work, which characters I need to screw over. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of excited to get to that. And of course, the entire time that's been going on, my uh, robot psychologist has been talking to me in my head. 
So uh, Dr. G is very much alive in my skull and babbling like a moron. So I just got to go write his stories at some point. Sounds very exciting. Yeah. Too much shit to do. You can obviously tell I'm a little manic today. Not a bad thing. It's just uh, uh, excitement and a lot of stress has been relieved for the moment. Because next week I have essentially next week off. Whoop, whoop. And I can do whatever the fuck I want. Whoop, whoop. Hopefully, I'll be recording and writing. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where things are. Anyway, what's up with you, man? I am editing Victory on Terra. And because it's it's a slog for me going through the editing, it always is. I've never, I'm never excited about going through the editing. It's fun taking the story and refining it to get what I want it to say, but it feels like work. It's not like storytelling. It feels like work. So... Over the last couple of days, I've started interspacing the chapters of um, Victory on Terra with recording the first book in the Imperial Marine Saga. Okay. I've discovered that while I can't write two stories at once, I can edit one and write a different one at the same time. Right. That doesn't seem to trigger my brain in the same way. I think that is easier because you have you have one product that is done and out of your head. <laughs> and so it's easier to disassociate yourself during the editing, editing process. And I think that's ex that's exactly what it is. The changes that I'm making are fixing the um, errors that come in through the dictation and refining the way that I'm saying something and, and correcting that. I'll go back through it a second time to uh, add more detail as I think I need it once I've got it cleaned up that this first one is, is something of a slog. And it's definitely more work-like than storytelling-like. So yeah. I think I'm going to have a good time telling the story of uh, Imperial Marines while I'm doing the other. And it may make me even more productive next year. We'll see. This has been a productive month. I wrote 86,000 words this month. Fuck you. And I'm sure most of the listeners are saying the same thing. <laughs> and they would be right to say it. <laughs> They would be totally right to say it. It's okay to feel envy in your hearts, people. So what is your actual goal for 2020? My actual goal is I usually say, I'm going to try to do X number of books. I'm not going to try to do X number of books. What I'm going to try to do is edit and write story as I go along. It, I always try to do more than I think I can do. And it always ends up depressing me. So this time, I'm going to focus on the small and try to get some of each in on every day. If I do that, I suspect I'll have my most productive year ever. But I'm not going to try to put a number to it. Probably a good idea. I think I've given up on numbers, too. Um, it's really cool when I go back and I look at my word count for the day and go, what? Uh, how did I just write 2,000 words without stopping? And you, you just sit there for a minute and you're like, okay, that's great. And you get interrupted and you don't go back for the day. Or you're like me, it's 1030 at night. I'm falling asleep and I wander into my goddamn study, turn on the light to check something before I go to bed. And then I see that last dangling line I wrote and suddenly I'm back at the computer. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I think I'm going to do is try to consume more fiction. I want to try and read at least a book a month. I've been really bad about not listening to audiobooks. I have a whole ton of them stacked up, and I have uh, other ebooks I need to read. And now that I have a pair of reading glasses that work, because progressives suck if you're in bed trying to read or something on those lines. Progressives are. I, just thought, I thought that was a weird, you know, anti-liberal sexual rant you were on there, but now I've got you. Progressives. In bed. Come on now. Play with me here. Work with me. Yes, patrons, I have bifocals. Okay. <laughs> That's a roundabout way of saying these are bifocals. Progressive bifocals. And they, uh, they're not very good for reading. Uh, so if you're reading in bed or on the couch or whatever, they suck for that. Anyway, regardless, uh, there's a, there are some books I want to read that are by authors that I've never heard of. And I want to get them on uh, Kindle so I can actually kind of enjoy the uh Books I want to I want to focus on more than I necessarily want to be quote unquote entertained by, so that's uh, that's kind of also in my plans. I definitely want to read more. 
I am seeing if I can bring up my statistics here. Oh, boy. Because I want to. That reminds me, did you see the article about uh, uh, blaming Apple's, uh, Apple and millennials for the, the downfall of ebooks? I don't believe that I did, no. I think we're going to have to find that article and send it to you. It's, it's rather interesting. What they're maintaining is what killed ebooks for millennials are the fact that they've become so expensive. And I'm not talking about the indie scene. They're talking about the majority of the, of the, of the, uh, the books sold that are tracked and etc. Saying basically that the agency model is what killed ebooks for that entire group because suddenly the prices went from four ninety nine to twelve ninety nine. I know what I can do. I am going to bring up on my screen something here to share with the people that actually have the the video on this. You do realize we're still in the intro, right? Well, yeah, but you could you could trim this out if you like. But Turn I think it it's up. interesting. What are you doing? You recognize that? I can't even tell what that is, dude. Let me see if I can get back to this. The video is, is all trashed. Oh, my God. Hang on. I'm trying to get back to the video here so I can see what the hell you're doing. What the hell I'm doing. Wow. There we go. Ooh, look at that. It's like a weird effect. Ooh, Check that shit out. Yeah, baby. That's, I'm I'm nation fucking wide. Look at that. <laughs> that is that is some awesome shit there. So you okay. do not that, want that many Pauls. You just do not All want right. that many Pauls. I will bring it back to the other screen here. Can you see that? Marathoner. Mm-hmm. That's my audible statistics. Oh, okay. Your audible statistics, yeah. So let's see. I've yeah, listened to two months cool. of audio time, and I've got like just over six hundred, just over five hundred books to read. Five hundred thirty-one titles. That's not just over five hundred, dude. That's okay. that's more than five hundred. That's more than a quarter of five hundred. So yeah, it's fun. I've got a lot of books that I want to read that I've picked up that I haven't actually done anything with, and I really want to catch up with it. I really want to start listening to all these stories that I thought were good enough to pick up. And now I want them. Yeah. I, I found that if I read, uh, actually read before I go to bed for like 10 or 15 minutes, it really helps me crash. So. You can go ahead and cut the, the video part out. I just wanted to show you yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So you can you can cut that section of it out. No worries. But uh, I've, I've already listened for an hour today while I was at the gym. I've got more story that I want to listen to. And I'm continuing to pick up more books faster than I can listen to them. <laughs> Yeah, I know how that is. Anyway, so sounds like we're both uh, ready to rock the new year, which starts in six and a, no, eight and a half hours. Like seven and a half hours. Seven and a half hours. Seven hours and fifteen minutes, at least from where we are. You gonna stay up for the you know the big countdown? I won't have a choice because all these assholes are gonna be firing off the illegal fireworks because that's what they do every fucking year. I'll be asleep. I won't care. Yeah, that will wake me up. So I'm sure I'll find something on YouTube or Netflix or I'll go back to my computer and crank up the music and uh, try and get some work done. So we'll see. Anyway. All right, folks. We should get to the meat of this and we've got a guest for you. And now you're going to know why I forced you to host the show. <laughs> Absolutely. And with that, folks, let's cut straight to the interview, and we'll give you the name then. Oh, you are wussing out so bad. You are such a coward. You are such a coward. Oh, my God. Oh, you are such a coward. Okay, for the, for, for the record, neither one of us can pronounce this properly. Our Texas tongues are too stupid for it. So It's totally true, but uh, luckily enough. There's too many for us. <laughs> So, let's find out what they are. <laughs> All right, we have to get one embarrassing question out of the way first. Okay. How in the hell do I pronounce your name? <laughs> um, okay, so it's Anjay. But you can call me Yuda. Yuda? Yes. It's, Yuda. Uh, okay. it's like Yuda Anjay. Ironically, that's... Uh, not the name I have to go by when I apply for visas or things like that. 
uh, because it's one of seven names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's a story actual, in there somewhere. <laughs> so my actual name is Rajapaksa Konara Mudian Silage Bilesha Yudanje Bandara Vijayaratna. Holy shit, how the yes. fuck do you put that on a passport? Most of it does. Well, on my passport it does, but visa forms, no. So every time I go through immigration, like particularly if it's to some place like South Africa where they cap the form tightly, the officer just looks at this and goes, are, they, are these all your names? Your parents did not love you, did they? <laughs> <laughs> so this happens every single time. Uh, yeah, yeah. The good thing is I get all the unique email addresses, so my parents clearly knew what they were doing in the digital age. But uh, other than that, I'm completely screwed, yeah. <laughs> yes, but can anyone actually remember to type in the right address if they need to find you? Uh, that's that's a bit of an advantage, you know, because I don't really want people find him. <laughs> I, run a, I, I run a fact checker, and sometimes we have to fact check politicians, some of whom have uh, set up uh -huh. paramilitaries in the past. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka is a very colorful place, so it's a bit a bit of an advantage of everybody going with who is this guy? Like, does anyone know how to spell him? Like, can we just shoot him now, or do we like like you know figure out how to write his name first? So it's it's pretty interesting, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen uh, some of your Facebook posts over the last year. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a uh, you know interesting times. Yeah, interesting time for everybody. It seems like. All right. So, how do you pronounce your full author name? Yudanje Vijayaratna. Whoa. Yudanje Vijayaratna. I know how we're going to get through this. We're going to have you say your own name. <laughs> we're, we're going just, to cheat. We're, we're just going to say, hey, you. <laughs> when, I was in, when I was in nursery, right, um, the teachers couldn't get my name right either. Uh, so they gave me this pin. I still have it. And it basically has my name on it. So I had to be identified by this thing. And as, as I went through school, this, this thing continued. So I have, like, you know, various chess club certificates addressed to and Udayanga Vijirata, who doesn't exist. I have um, my Internet Governance Forum pass is to Abilesha Rajapaksa, again, who doesn't really exist. Look, people have been cobbling together bits of a name for ages. This, this means he can't be held liable for anything because nobody really knows who the hell he is. Nobody really if, knows. If trouble ever comes calling you up, that's not me. That's not me. That's, that's not me. just that's uh, that's a sub part of me. <laughs> it's not really it's one of my personalities. It's, it's not me. Yeah, that 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 combination is not fully sentient. I yeah, not see, really that sub part of me owes you money, but the rest of me doesn't know you. <laughs> <laughs> this, that is this, awesome. I like now, this. <laughs> uh, the, the advantage is well, SEO, of course. The disadvantage is to get to SEO, people have to be able to type the damn thing. Yeah, that's an issue. So is that is that common for Sri Lankans or mm -hmm. to have that it's, many? Um, yeah, it's, I'm actually not that rare in, term, in Sri Lankan terms. The most I've heard is eleven names because how it how it works is in the old system, which was before the British sort of came. Uh, you have your clan names on the front, and the way Sinhala names work is that's that's the that's like the majority language of Sri Lanka. So the way it works is you can actually break these words down to identify where the person came from. So Raja Paksa, Raja is king, Paksha is clan. Uh, Konar Mudiansilage, that's a name, but Mudiansila, Mudiansi implies he was into some economic activity, which was kind of frowned upon, possibly merchant class. So merchant class guy elevated himself to the ruling clan at some point. And it says Mudian Sila Gay, so I am descended from him. So essentially set up the dynasty. Bilesha Yudanja is my name. Bandara Vijay Ratna are two clans that in the Ratnapura area sort of eventually realized that well inbreeding is bad. So <laughs> let, let's expand our options a bit. Uh, but the, but, but jokes aside, they were two politically rather involved clans. Uh, and they had a fusion and they, you know, faced the original hyphenation challenge about a couple of hundred years ago. And they said, okay, fine. But we'll call ourselves Bandara Vijayaratna from now on. So you wow. can sort of break down a person's name and kind of figure out where their ancestors were in terms of, you know, where they came from and so on. So that's one that, you know, there's a whole set of people who preserve their names like that. Then there's like Sunil Pereira, 
or Ranjan Ramanayaka, things like that, where uh, when the British systems were brought in identification and so on, they said, no, first name, surname. You can't have surnames in front and surnames at the back and have your name in the middle. So people went, okay, they have guns. Cool. <laughs> right, so do what the angry men with guns say. So you have, uh, you have Portuguese names. You have, uh, uh, you have not a lot of English names, but you have that structure and the format. That is really wild. That is really wild. I can't believe there aren't fantasy and sci-fi authors are ripping off that very, very simple truth for how their characters' <laughs> names work. I mean, uh, you'll find a lot of Indian fantasy that does, but the downside uh, with it is it's not written in English. Right. Okay. Um, so, for, so, for example, in uh, I was talking to this Indian uh, science fiction critic, very, very well. Uh, is there like a buzzing noise coming from the fan? I don't hear it. Okay, I don't hear it. cool. Because uh, it's uh, it's about 30 Celsius here. I'm slowly melting. Um, <laughs> so there was this science fiction critic uh, who I was, I was talking to. And this, this man is wonderfully well-educated, right? Uh, uh, Sachi and Sachi copywriter sort of then started writing about science fiction. And I realized that you know, he's mentioning authors to me that I've never heard of because I only can read like three languages, right? Singular English. I like how you say that only. only. Oh, no, this guy knows six. <laughs> His native tongue is sort of a spoken dialect of Sanskrit, which is one of the great classical languages. So I it's like, it's like finding a Roman. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, talking to this guy is like seeing a native Latin speaker. And on top of that, he can speak Marathi, he can speak Canada. He has, you know, he, he's talking to me about these science fiction writers who have followings of like millions. I've never heard of these people. And they've been, because they're like, oh, English, we don't care. We have, we have everything we need right here. And I've seen this when he invited me to a couple of lit fests, uh, like the Bangalore Literary Festival. Uh, 50,000 people showed up to hear wow. like yeah and and it was it was on a day where people feared um, riots there's there's a whole you know there's a lot of political stuff going on yes. in india right now people feared riots this is not the largest uh, convention in india it's a community run convention like it's completely non corporate people donate and that's how the whole thing is floated but 50,000 people showed up so I can believe it when he tells me there are people working in other languages using these names and using the, all these dynamic histories, but we, we just never hear of them. We don't see them on the first page of Google. Mm. You, you have totally got into what I wanted to talk about before we <laughs> even started the show. We, you can ask me something suitably weird instead. <laughs> I've, uh, I've, got, I've got Gypsy Danger. I've got Chino Alpha, um, but okay, fine. And I have uh, an now decapitated Chino Alpha, and I have a chunk of the Berlin Wall on my desk. I want to hang out with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get to any sure. of the other exciting things, let me go ahead and and run through the the basics of what we're going to do. What we're doing right now is pretty much what we're going to do during the talk. <laughs> it is not an interview. Seriously, we don't interview people. We talk to people. And what we're doing it. right now I is love, exactly. I love your podcast. I love your podcast. I listen to it almost every day. Oh, you poor so bastard. What we're going to do is um, we're going to go ahead and officially mark the starting point, even though the patrons are listening to what has come before. But we're going to start it now because if we don't officially start it, then it's just going to just keep wandering and we're going to have to do some awkward insertion somewhere earlier in this. And hey, go, hey, no, hey, really, this hey, is where hey, we started. Hey. That's true. That's true. We don't know him well enough to have the, use that kind of language. Speak for yourself. I have awkward insertions with all kinds of people that I can't pronounce their name. You know, anything's a dildo if you're brave enough. Wow. Unless you can't, unless you can't use that language on radio. Um, wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> including language. Fine. Let's let's move it out from the gutter and into Wittgenstein. Exactly, so. All languages context for all. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Hello, God. everybody, and welcome to the Dead Robot Society. I'm Terry Mixon. Joining me, Paul E. Cooley 
and our friend Yuda, who is going to pronounce his own name because I would horribly mispronounce it, and that would not be fair. My name is Yudanje Vijayaratne, but again, you can call me Yuda. There we go. This is, this is a good thing because I would feel bad when I totally mispronounce our, 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 our Texas uh, our Texas language centers are not just not able to process that many <laughs> much for less those, put them in the right order for those of you who do not know who, who this is and you should all know who he is he is an author from Sri Lanka who was a finalist for the nebulas last year and is a finalist for the nebulas this year congratulations on that uh, I still don't know how I feel about that but well, thank you <laughs> I, I can understand. I totally, I totally can. As, oh, as yeah. a member of SIFWA, right. I, I'm, I'm plugged into what's going on there, and I can, I can feel the ambivalence. I, I feel it as well. So you're not alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you can look forward and say, hey, at least it's not the dumpster fire that the Romance Writers of America is right now. Oh my God! I just saw some tweets, and they're insane. <laughs> they are nuts. <laughs> we were just talking about that. We're like, when did this happen? When did this come up? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Was on fire. It's it's like seeing you know Archduke Ferdinand being shot and the First World War starting and you're basically Switzerland and you're going well, what's happening over there? Why are these people doing this stuff? Weirdly enough, that is exactly the same analogy that my wife used yesterday. <laughs> it's totally World War One. It's a World, World War One. Archduke yeah. Ferdinand being assassinated <laughs> was, the, was exactly the metaphor she used. We see that to avoid combat and another World War. To, to make sure that never happens. We'll, we'll yeah. construct this huge web of nasty yes. alliances where if one block so much as moves, the whole goddamn thing crashes. Yes, that's, that seems to be what's happening. They're not at the mutually assured destruction nuclear <laughs> weapons phase yet, but that, that will eventually, I assume. Happen. I don't know. I think that's where it started. It started with nukes. I don't know. It may not be a nuke, but it's certainly a dumpster on fire floating down the river. God, yes. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, um, why is it that American authors are so full of drama? I don't know. I try to avoid the drama, but some people uh -huh. just seem like they want to be involved in what's going on. And they'll make whatever right. problems are going on their problems. Right. Because I, I've sort of like started following a lot of authors I know and respect, and I, I love their work. And as a result, you get those retweets. People you're not following, but people you have followed have retweeted. And my f Twitter feed is this weird schizophrenic thing. Like half of it is about, you know, Nazi inspired people marching in India right now or bombs going off or policy or stuff like that, stuff that I engage in on my day-to-day -day work. And the other half of it is someone like several tens of thousands of people talking about how X person did Y and it turns out to be a very small slight that some some gesture misinterpreted or something. And I'm like, the, there's, there's this weird dichotomy. The, I have the, to be fair. I stopped using Twitter in 2014 and have not regretted it one single moment since. Oh, really? Okay. No, that's why we always end the show with you can tweet me at my Twitter address. But not him. But, but not, not me. Him. I have okay, no right. interest in sticking my hand into that. And right. I've pretty much left Facebook. <laughs> so there you go. He's yeah. yeah. The other. I mean, Harry's on Facebook. So I get his updates. I don't see you there at all. So I was hoping like some conversation about like raging on each other's books would happen. But like, okay, I have oh, to follow it, this it still happens. It's just a matter of I'm not, I'm just not <laughs> there very often. I yeah. just rage without him. Yeah, I've um, I, I found Twitter useful to sort of my day job as in data science, policy, journalism. Um, nobody actually seems to give a shit about what I'm writing there. So, so we like, are totally okay, cool. interested in what you're doing. Tell us more about what you do. Uh, so I write science fiction, of course. Uh, I wrote my, I published my first novel in 2017. That was Numbercast. Uh, Self-published it. HarperCollins picked it up, offered me a five book deal, um, and then. As uh, recently, Endemol Shine, the people who did Black Mirror, MasterChef, Big Brother, uh, they actually sound like a detergent, detergent company, Endemol Shine, but they are serious, I mean, serious players in, in production, and I'm hoping this works, but they've optioned Numbercast, the, oh, the awesome. film rights on Numbercast. Congrats. Yeah. So um, 
I am now working through the Commonwealth Empires trilogy, which is what I'm writing for HarperCollins. It's uh, it's number cast was very five minutes into the future stuff. Uh, the Commonwealth Empires is a complete switch from what I was doing. It's a, it's about a post-colonial Ceylon, that is what Sri Lanka used to be called. Uh, the British are still there. It's 2033. Someone's come up with this idea called machine learning. Oh, God. And someone else has gone, well, to train those bots, you know, the, the whole city of Colombo, the capital of, uh, of Sri Lanka right now, is, is in ruins. That's after the Chinese and the British sort of invaded and had a clash there. Ceylon was the proxy war. Hang on, that city is lying in ruins. So why don't we do a Lord of the Flies thing and broadcast a battle royale live while training these things in an actual battlefield situation? What so could it, possibly go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So, so like the first book is basically about can we recognize intelligence in things not similar to us as, as humans? Um, this is the old John Seal Chinese room argument um how do you actually tell that something is processing what you're sending it like for example i could be telling you all this i could just be a really smart but dumb algorithm in the sense that i can understand the english syntax the lexicon connect phrases together feed them back out to you um, and it sounds like i'm intelligent but i'm actually not self-aware that's so how first i feel every is... day <laughs> <laughs> so harry, harry hasn't been yeah. self-aware in decades <laughs> um is bliss, uh, <laughs> they say. Uh, so yeah, I did that. And uh, as a function of my job, I am a data scientist. I lead the uh, AI and algorithms team at an outfit called Learn Asia. We do research across 22 countries in the global south. And then we, uh, the polite pitch is like, we try to influence policy to catalyze better decision making. But really, we try to get governments to do what we think is right, which is pro, you know, pro poor, pro market. Uh, we like markets in economies. We think they're extreme. Uh, they, they have they've been the, one of the strongest instruments in reducing inequality. And we our research is focused on the bottom of the pyramid. I'm not necessarily interested in the rich. They can take care of themselves. Uh, so as a function of that, we do a lot of applied AI engineering, which feeds into uh, another three books that I'm doing because I went. Um, Okay, what if I was supremely lazy, which I am, and I want to write this story about two AI poets, uh, you know, coming to having an argument and then coming to some sort of first contact. And then I was like, well, I don't really want to write poetry, but this is about a machine poet. So can I build a machine poet? Oh, yeah, cool. I can. Open AI's new GPT-2 stuff. You can train it on poetry. Um, and I have this nice mix of poetry that I like. 5th century Tang Dynasty stuff uh, and Pablo Neruda. So wow. you have conversations developing there. Um, and then I went, okay, wait, this is basically, um, I mean, this is, this is, a, gen this is a generator. Uh, what other systems can I bring into play? So I have things constructing planets, things telling me what the weather is like on every single chapter, things that map out character interactions. So there's an entire set of experimental first contact slash space opera fiction that I'm actually co-writing with a bunch of models that I've designed and developed. Oh, God. Yes, I want to automate humans out of the picture. No. Well, not out of the picture. As a human, I object. This is, the dead robot cool. society. this is the dead robot society. I thought yes, we, we, want right. we want them we dead. We want them dead. <laughs> yes, but first for them to be dead, they have to be alive. Uh, no. Uh -huh. No, no, we yes. kill them before you, they, they can't. They can't start out there. Nope, you've got, they've got to be alive before they're dead. That's how that's <laughs> yeah. works. Yeah. So I'm working on the alive bits, and then you can do the John Connors and Terminator stuff. Well, you know, the burning <laughs> question I have, and this, this is, I'm being very sarcastic when I say that. The burning question that I have about writing something involving the British in 2033. Oh God! Is, is Brexit still going on? That's what I want to know. <laughs> um, Yes, we, we, many of us suspect that, that several thousand years from now, um, you know, the British leader or the biggest of the warlords will cross Europe by foot to come to Berlin and demand that they be allowed, they be given another year. And nobody will really know why, but millions will gather to watch and clap. <laughs> uh, you know, we, 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 will, we will achieve faster than light travel. By the I, time I, they, they, they I saw a... Uh... 
a Warhammer 40,000 K <laughs> thing about yeah. somebody coming there. And that was totally the same sort of thing. Nobody understood yep. why it just yep. was. Yep. Yep. I mean, I mean, there are entire colonies of bacteria on the Red Sea that move faster. So <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I feel petty saying this, but it's nice to see Britain fucking up <laughs> um, because, you know, our history is, you know, we gained independence in 1948 and so on. And the conditions that they left the country in the divide and, pol uh, divide and conquer policy, particularly when it came to dividing races that had sort of ethnicities, particularly that had coexisted for, you know, we have 2000 years of documented history. Our country is old, right? Uh, that led to civil war. The civil war in Sri Lanka ended in 2009. That's 30 years of war. Um, so it's nice to see Britain screwing up because, like, you realize that when you talk to a lot of people in Britain, unless they happen to be rather intelligent and educated, they're just not aware of what was done. For them, it's like, oh, cool, we improved those countries, we built roads and stuff. So sometimes when I talk about these things on Facebook, I get people popping up and saying, how dare you say these things? My grandfather came to your country to build a railway. Like, you mean the railway where at one end you bought in a million uh, Tamils from India without giving them any kind of citizenship rights and just drop them in the middle of the country, making them slave labor to this day, where they earn less than $10 a day, $10 a month. Then that's one end of the railway. The other end of the railway was the port where you ship the tea out and you brought the tax revenue back to Britain. You mean that railway? And they go, oh, and you put it that way. Yes, so, when you put it that way. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, I feel petty saying it because um, I have a lot of friends there as well. It's It sucks to see the people suffer. I love to see the system suffer. I don't want to see the people suffer. So, Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, stupid is that, stupid is. There seems to be a lot of that. Very going hard around. for a lot there of. There is a lot of that going on, yeah. To pay attention to to history around the world, I I consider yeah. myself educated in a number of ways with American history and some of the mm -hmm. European history. The rest of it, I know that my my I'm basically ignorant of a lot of it. I know that. Mm -hmm. I Same. I have very little knowledge of European history at all, um, and I would say large chunks of Africa, I just don't know the countries. I haven't been to. I just don't know about at all. But uh, so many young people these days have no idea whatsoever. They don't. They actually don't. Um, which is like, which in our countries sometimes feels planned because we have, for example, if you take our grade 10 history books, we start 2,500 years ago, the founding myths and so on. And this goes on quite detailed, you know, which king built how many temples, who built these aqueducts. So you have a good idea of how these ancient ruins and cities that you're probably quite cr close to, how they came about. And then it kind of stops after independence. And nobody, then you, then you go out into the world, our, our schooling stops, um, like you get out of school at the age of 21 in Sri Lanka, which means you're already old enough to vote. You, um, you know, you have your driving license and everything. So you're supposed to be an adult, but you go out into the world and you don't actually understand how these systems came about. Why is that politician in power? Why is that guy who used to lead a paramilitary outfit in the 80s uh, and, you know, was actually quite famous for being a terrible person? Why is he one of the cabinet ministers? That's very interesting. How did that come about? So the causality in the events are just left conveniently left out. Uh, I mm. don't know if it's uh, a systemic issue, uh, but I strongly suspect that at least in countries in South Asia, in India and Sri Lanka and so on, this is deliberate, a part of a very deliberate propaganda machine. It could very well be. Uh, we're starting to see things here in the United States mm. with the education system being changed from one viewpoint or another of mm. people trying to put forth their own narrative. Yes. So we're seeing it a little bit as well. Yeah. Yeah. Every, yeah. It's, every uh, state is doing it and it's, it's yeah. It's, it's this uh it's this bizarre line of thinking of sort of this very Foucault Derrida line of thinking of personal truths, like let's forget the meta narrative, forget systematized thinking, individual personal truths because every person every you know, there is no one truth. Every person has individual truths and all of them are equal. And at some point you have to go, no, they aren't. 
<laughs> they, they just aren't. You can believe you walk on water. You can hold truth that you walk on water. But if you step on the ocean and you sink, um, yeah, move on to the next theory. And let's go with what we can you, repeatably test and experiment on and confirm in the real world. You can have your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Yes. Yes. Uh, Unfortunately, yeah. Life doesn't seem to, to be playing that way going forward for anybody these days. One of the reasons that we wanted to, to bring you on, that you started in the pre-show before we could really get going, is I wanted to ask you how it was being an author that's literally on the other side of the globe from most of the authors that I interface with. And oh, you started God, yes. telling this wonderful story about meeting a um, someone from India. And I'd like you to repeat that if you would. Oh, oh okay. 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 Um... So, sort of being an author here is uh, interesting because there is a lot of there is a lot of social and cultural value assigned to being an author. So, like for example, when I was coming to the Nebulas, uh, I had you know the the bombs had just gone off, so the airport was you know end to end military. Uh, so, you know, angry looking men with guns sort of looked at my bag, put it through several scanners, said, "So open it." Because the books are, you know, boxed up in plastic and so on. And they just saw the books. And they're like, why are you taking books? I said, I wrote it. And they immediately went, wow, okay, wow, this is this is really cool. Please go, please go right ahead. You know, several, several army men put down their guns, came up, shook my hand, and said, well, best of luck, wherever you're going. And we had we chat about RC Clark and so on, and they pushed me on onward. So there is great social value, yeah, in effect, assigned to being an author. Um, the, uh, the the really interesting part is there is how do I explain um, because of languages, right? I do envy countries like the US and the UK in a sense where you have a large population that essentially speaks the same language. Uh, whereas for us, it's it's often different. Like India, um, because I deal in large amounts of language data. Uh, India ethnolog lists four hundred twenty living languages uh, and twenty four. Uh, the problem is so vast that the government has to interface in somewhere like 24 languages legally, but they're actually, if you count all the dialects, there are 420. Um, so I was talking to this uh, science fiction critic uh, in, in India called Gautam Shinoi. Um, he writes for the Bangalore Mirror. And I sat down with the man and he was telling me about all these wonderful authors. I'm like, I've never heard of these people. Because I want to read more Indian sci-fi, right? I've read the Sri Lankan stuff. I've read a lot of Southeast Asian stuff. I've read, read lots of Japanese stuff. I'm like, Matang, where's the Indian stuff? And he's like, oh, you haven't heard of this, 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 this. And he's listing this entire thing. And I'm like, no. And like, well, some of these authors are huge. Like, millions of people read them. Okay. In Marathi, or in Urdu, or in Bengali, or in Hindi. Uh, basically not English. You don't see them on Google when you search for them because nobody's writing about them in English. Then these people are like, yeah, we don't care. You know, they go to literary festivals and hundreds of thousands of people uh, show up to, like in India, for, you know, literary festivals are extraordinarily huge. So these people have massive fan bases. And you see the most extraordinary stories and the most sophisticated work done there. Uh, and well, I've never heard of these people. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. So this guy, the, the critic I was talking to, speaks uh, six languages. And his, his native language in his village is a sort of oral form of Sanskrit. So for me, it's like, it's like meeting a native Latin speaker. And then he tells me that his, his way of life, his village is he's sort of dying out. And nobody really, the younger generation doesn't really care about the language anymore. So he's taken it upon himself to remember all their legends because they have their own sort of version of the Mahabharata, something that uh, sort of took a sidestep from the from the mainline version somewhere like 700 years ago. And these are all you know passed down orally. These are not written stuff. So he's taken it upon himself to remember all these traditions and language and then talk about these things. It's like, wow, this is incredible. Like, I actually want to live there. <laughs> That, it's wow. As as somebody that only speaks English, <laughs> I, it is it is hard for me to to grasp. And I I know that a lot of Americans are very provincial for for whatever reason. We've got our our heads buried in our own backyards. 
I and don't think it's an American thing. I think it's a it's a universal thing. Everywhere it's a, I'm going, country thing. You only pay attention yeah. to the countries near you or the ones that you are really big ties. To. Absolutely, absolutely. Or um, or homophily. Um, so I have um, a snapshot of the Facebook universe. Um, ooh, oh my God, he's so cute. Is that a cat? <laughs> That's a mini. That's a mini cat. Oh, mine's an absolute mini. asshole. She's my office cat. <laughs> I envy you. Mine, mine just looks at me and goes, no, no touching, no touch, no touch of merchandise. Give me. Food. Mine just That's sits it. up here and starts playing with cords. Mine so. just doesn't care. Mine's like living with a forty-year-old man who has seen a little <laughs> bit too much in his life and doesn't really give it. You know, thousand-yard stare. He's got the thousand-yard stare. He's got that <laughs> eternal judgment. And I'm just like sometimes I'm writing here and I'm just looking at him. He's looking at me and and he's going, what, what? You think you're hot? You think you're you think you're good? Fuck off! Give me food, human. That's him. That's his attitude. You're looking at me. You looking at me? Yes. You wouldn't. You people <laughs> yes. wouldn't believe. Yes. I have seen sea beams glittering <laughs> off of the shoulder of Orion. You know, all these things will pass away, human, like tears in the rain, except for cat food that lasts forever. <laughs> <laughs> as long as this tin. <laughs> yes, as long as this tin. Uh, so, so yeah. Sorry, I sort of dovetailed there. Um, <laughs> that's the ad advantage the diversity the language if you care to get into it the disadvantage of course is that we don't really have like i really envy you guys for the convention scene uh for the sort of it, it's strange but for the in a sense the clannishness as well um because groupings of, of the kind that i'm seeing among authors particularly american actually rather rare here like uh, there's so in Sri Lanka, for example, there's three, maybe four science fiction writers. Clark's uh, Arthur Clark is dead. Uh, there's Navin, the Wajra. Yeah, four people alive. Uh, yeah, in in then that's one country. Um, so we don't really have like even in India, where there where there is now a scene emerging. The convention scene, the act of getting together, the familiarity of it, you know, figuring out who your contemporaries are, working with them, working against them, whatever that, that almost doesn't exist. It's like you're working in your tiny isolated bubble and you sit there in front of the laptop and, you know, a bunch of strangers on Goodreads say nice things about you. And then you go outside and everyone's like, who are you? <laughs> Vegas must have been a shock to your system. In the, in the worst possible way. <laughs> um, Did you not like Plastic Town? I've never uh, actually been to Plastic Town, so. I, I, I mean, the people there are fantastic. I'm, I'm hoping that's what you meant. I actually uh, meant the writers' conference there. So yes, oh. the writers' conference was was rather interesting. interesting. No, because but before that, I had gone to Bangalore Lit Fest. And I was in conversation with Ian McDonald and, you know, what I was telling you earlier, 50,000 people showed up. I'm like, okay, fine. Vegas, I can maybe relax a bit. And there are these weird plastic bear sort of staring at me and making weird noises. And there's a statue of Caesar. And just underneath his toga or whatever is a vending machine. I'm like, why would you do this? There's a fake pyramid and a, a fake well, Rome, Roman palace, fake Eiffel and Tower. fake Eiffel Tower. And I was traveling with David Dan Wood. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful man. So he, he's taking me around Vegas, and, and he points to something and says, well, at some point, we ran out of cultures to steal, so we started stealing from our own culture. <laughs> like, That's the only building I like. Let's go there. Uh, and there was this sort of miniature New York, and I was like, why? Because it felt like it had been constructed yesterday. Yeah, like, I, I didn't get you. Know, you know what I mean, right? There's that's no, no age the, to it. It's plastic. It's, it's, that's yeah. not so yeah, yeah. far away. <laughs> it's all plastic. It's it's just it, yeah. it's so cheesy. It's like if he goes, if um, I, I watch a lot of hockey, and uh, they had their their new hockey team. I guess they got last year or the year before. I don't remember, but we played them in the playoffs. Team I yeah. follow. So I got to see these assholes. Their opening thing when they open up and, and introduce the players. It was the most god awful, garish oh, shit <laughs> I have ever seen at a sporting event. It was so cheesy and horrible. I went, "That is so Vegas." 
It was all glitter and gold and looked just so bad. Um, so bad. That just felt so off to me because, uh, like, you know, the difference between Vegas and a cup of yogurt to me is if you leave a cup of yogurt open for five years, it'll develop a culture. <laughs> 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 Whereas Vegas just hadn't, it felt like it hadn't really got around to it. The thing I most enjoyed was the Mob Museum. The which museum? The Mob Museum. Mob, yeah, oh, the Mob Museum. Okay, I've never been to yeah. Vegas, so it was fun. Uh, it was it was nice, but the mobsters I felt were uh, a little um, not scary enough. <laughs> Like, you know, I, 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 I walked in thinking, oh, my God, I've, I've heard about these guys. It's like, wait, hang on. He only killed 30 people? Only? That's, it's like, that's amateur level, bro. Like, what, what are you doing? Like, get but, up to okay. the number. These days, it's amateur level back in, depending on when that was. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> no, fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe not. Fair well, enough. It's, it's not how many they killed. It's how they killed them. Yeah. These days, amateurs. Eh. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Wholesale yeah, yeah. slaughter is so easy, so much easier these days. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm sure if I mean all you gotta do is uh archaeologists, you know, Vegas <laughs> gets destroyed. All they gotta do is drive like in any direction for twenty kilometers outside Vegas and start digging and they'll find a body. But you know, like imagine that that would be a fantastic story. World gets destroyed and a bunch of aliens come over and they find Vegas. What are they gonna think of us? <laughs> They, they think this is the library of Alexandria because clearly the humans have created replications of their own culture and stored them. So this must have been a very important place. It's in the middle of a desert. So again, dry air, you know, preserving, preserving things, mummification, all of that. And this must be a nice place, but then they'll find a, a slot machine. <laughs> and some of those hot dogs that I ate. Yeah, holy randomizer. <laughs> yes. And they'll go, well, okay. This is why we haven't contacted this planet. Let, let's, let's go back home, guys. Let's go back home. Yeah, there was nothing here intelligent to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we like the cats, though. Grab one of those. <laughs> well, they say that's, that's one of the possible solutions to the Fermi paradox is that civilizations just kill themselves off by using up their resources. So, you know, that's probably us too. Or they wound up in gambling debt and had to sell their planet. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds like a Douglas yeah. Adams plot. Yeah, and, and you know those um, little wandering plants, the rogue plants, that actually comprise a sizable portion of a galaxy? What if they're your, your intergalactic equivalent of, you know, your broke and homeless in debt? It's mobile uh, home. Yeah, it's an RV, essentially. They've, they've taken your star and sent you packing. They've, they've You've they've been evicted. It's a Chinese yeah. junk just floating through yeah. the harbor space. They've, right? they've taken your star. You have no medical insurance. You have, you know, you're not going to last past the next thousand years. And you're like, damn, we're screwed. So they're just done. It's health insurance at a civilizational level. Imagine the story we could write on this. Oh, my God. That's effed up. This is totally doable. <laughs> all, all galaxy, you're never gonna believe this. <laughs> yes, this is this is gonna be. Uh, yeah, this galactic can go arm. <laughs> I'm naming off insurance company names. <laughs> Jupiter, Bob. twisting them around. Yeah, absolutely. Terry's horrified. How like how like the cast giants effectively monopolize healthcare. <laughs> Yeah, but, but you know, Vegas was also incredible in that when I landed, I realized it was for me like, you know, here building a road takes takes a bloody long time. And it, it's more a string of potholes loosely connected by the idea of a road than an actual <laughs> And I, I would land at them and these people are mad. They have constructed in a desert a functional city large roads possibly a little bit larger not really human centric but they've managed to build an entire city in a dry and arid desert and they have so much water that they've got fountains playing up uh, against the fake eiffel tower it's an incredible feat of engineering and it that is. infrastructure is actually quite old it's not you know like it was made in the last decade i was like wow this is you know this is engineering it's amazing what gambling 
and mob money. <laughs> and mob money and PayPal. <laughs> yes. I mean, you can talk all you want about how <laughs> you, you can talk about how you know anything union, but let me tell you something. They built Vegas. They built Somebody Vegas. had to go do that shit. Yeah, yeah. I was I was deeply impressed by the level of engineering there. Honestly. What about the writing conference? What did you think of that? All the, the various writers there from, from various levels of writing, trying to, to network and, and learn what's going on. Right. I, I absolutely loved it. I mean, I, I don't get to go to a lot of writing conferences um, on sort of that side of the world. I absolutely loved it. Um, I was probably a little sicker than I should have been because I was experimenting with the food. And it was the first time I had come across um, a buffet. Oh, no. That's that's a dangerous thing. Yes, I mean, sort of the American, you know, the large breakfast buffet thing. We have buffets, but not that particular combination that you have. Um, so it was insane fun, um, interspersed with periods of insane gastrointestinal anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I had a I had an absolutely great time. Um, for me, it was as a bit of an introvert. It was a little bit large. Uh, so it was a bit of a shock to go interact with all those people at the same time. So I just kept talking to pockets and pockets and pockets of people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much what, what I did as well. I was yeah. afraid. I knew you were there yeah. and I'd wanted to see you, but I was afraid yeah. I wasn't going to because I was like, he's nowhere. Where is he? I don't ever see him anywhere. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I know. I just kept getting swept away by like, I'd be talking with two people here and then someone else who knew me. Oh, hey, come on. And like, okay, we'll give you free milkshakes. Okay, right, let's do this. <laughs> and I just end up being sort of dragged away. And I had a whale of a time. But at the end of it, everyone would be like messaging me on Facebook going, where the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> this is just perfectly reasonable. I was abducted by drive-bys. I, yes, I, well, I let myself be abducted. I had a great, yeah, I had a great time. Oh well, yeah, it's kind of hard to meet people if you don't like, you know, meet people. Yes, they tell me that's um, necessary. <laughs> yes, it um, interfacing with the humans. Uh, yes, I don't like writing a program. Scary. For it. <laughs> scary. So, as as somebody that writes in Sri Lanka, how did you come to the attention of Harper Collins? It it seems that they would they would be fairly far afield, and I'm I'm sure there's an interesting story behind that. Um. So, Numbercast did really well on Amazon, surprisingly. Um, and then I got an Indian. Well, HarperCollins obviously has operations across the world, including HarperCollins India. Yes. Uh, so I was contacted by an Indian agent who turned out to be possibly the biggest uh, literary agent in South Asia right now. Um, and then he went, you know, you're doing some interesting stuff. Uh, let me talk to let me talk to some people I know. Uh, so it was honestly for me as well. It was a bit of a surprise and a shock because the traditional path just like I had deliberately gone indie because I had read read so much and I had friends who had you know been getting rejection slips for years, and I was like I don't I'm not a very patient person, um, and I know that the quality of my prose will improve. And we'll keep improving, but first I need feedback on on this and so on. And I have this idea that I want to get out in the world, uh, because you know I had I published a book, and a month afterwards, uh, the news of China's social credit system broke. And Numbercast is essentially that it's explore, exploring the second order effects of such a system. Well, I pointed out, you know, sure you can replace economic credit, the, the FICO scoring system with social influence, can be done, but if you do that. Um, children inherit the social networks of their parents. Correct. So the son or daughter of uh, a, a security guard is always going to be at that level where the son or daughter of a billionaire can be at that level. So your marketing pitch would essentially be for the first time in human history, the artist is as important as the billionaire. Wonderful. But the second generation, we're going to reset back. So, and what it does is limit upward class mobility because if you're now being traced, there's a number on you, you cannot escape the system. Hence, an algorithmically enforced caste system, number caste. So I, f I feel that it was a bit of a fluke because the book came out a month later, China's credit scoring system came out, and that generated a lot of attention on the book itself. 
Mm. Timing is everything sometimes. Uh, it was by, like, in my mind, I mean, I had failed, honestly. It was not a, for me, it was, like, I had known about the Chinese credit system since they started experimenting in a small village in 2010. I have a few journalists there, journalist friends there. Um, and for me, it was like, okay, so they're doing this. Let me explore what that might look like in about 10 years time or how that system might be constructed or how you'd sell it to the West in a mark, primary market economy where you can't have a top-down authoritarian government push, but you can sell it as microservices in the market. Say, for example, <laughs> you know, any business that needs to discriminate between, uh, between its customers, a, b- a bounce in a nightclub, for example, he, he has to go, well, do I let this person in or not? Now with this, he can say, you, I know, I know you dance regularly, but guys in here tonight, they're 8K, you're just 5K, sorry. You're not getting in. And that to him is a clear-cut decision now. He's, he's being aided in his decisions. Top-end restaurants. So you can sell this in different ways. Um, I was just exploring that, the art of how you'd pitch it, in my mind. Um, somehow the two sort of spun itself into this local news cycle that ended up in a few um, Indian and Bangladeshi and Pakistani papers. Uh, Half Post did a piece about it. And then before I knew it, you know, this guy was calling saying, oh, hey, uh, Harper Collins would like you to do five books for them. I'm like, okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. That was unplanned. And that was a I, monumental stroke of luck. It, it, it's well-earned luck because you definitely, I'm going to be honest. I write adventure fiction that is much less well thought out as some of the things that you have worked, that you have written. I don't try to, I don't try to put in that level of complexity and I look at what you're writing. I go, Holy shit. Well, well, I cheat a bit, right? Because as, as part of my job, he's got the computer um, writing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know if it's me or the air. Well, ideally in 10 years, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, but um, I, I do a bit of futurism work. Where I did some for the UNDP recently. Uh, so it, they want to know about the future of uh, this this region, the sort of Asia Pacific region, would be by 2030. You know, so we went did look at government policy, plans, projections, the whole nine yards, economics, future of warfare. Like Singapore has some interesting DV submarine designs. They're very cool. Uh, so, so we did all this stuff and we laid it out and called it the ocean of change. So I cheat a bit because someone just paid my team seventy thousand dollars to do that piece of research. Gotcha. You that's best. gonna end up. That's gonna end up in one of my books sometime. <laughs> like most of that is gonna end up there. Nice. That's yeah. so nice that you can take that that stuff at work and just throw it right into. I just, uh... I just put it right there. Oh, I actually nice. I really enjoy books like yours, Terry. Like uh, I am right now reading. I reread James Clavell's Shogun because mm-hmm. that is a ride like nothing else before. Uh, I'm reading Scalzi. The Collapsing Empire. Uh, and I've got um, uh, M- M- Murderbot, Martha Wells. Yeah. Which is absolutely fun. I, I was watching The Witcher uh, two nights ago. It's like, okay, Watchmen, absolutely brilliant storytelling, utterly brilliant. I want to watch each episode frame by frame. But if I was to binge watch something, I'm going to binge watch uh, Henry Cavill <laughs> killing a lot of people. My wife says it's amazing. <laughs> It is utterly amazing. He, he he's basically says, hmm, and fuck, and kills things. Oh, that's the video game. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I don't mean to put it's down... Basically the video. I absolutely don't. I'm not trying to put down what I write. I just know what I write. I, I write yeah, a, yeah. a fairly straightforward adventure fiction. I don't try to be complex. So I'm not putting down what I write. I enjoy what I do. Yeah. For me, like, I, I want to write the... For me, like I enjoy the act of writing, and I would, I genuinely would love to, for example, be a full-time writer. I'm sort of working towards it, uh, not there yet, but I've realized that I may actually never be a full-time writer because I enjoy my job a lot, um, and I enjoy putting the complexity in there. And I understand that. This means that sometimes my work is like some people love my work, other people go, "No, this guy is." He's, he's full of bullshit. He's just trying to be pseudo intellectual. Screw him. <laughs> you know, the, it, it the complexity is it's 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 like you're you you've got the puzzle, but you're still trying to figure out what it looks like. 
And yes. I've, I've explained yes, this before it is. where you have to go through in, in that piece. You may have to carve a bit hard to make it fit in that one damn slot you need to do. Absolutely. Because the Absolutely. pieces have to be carved to fit. Absolutely. And then you realize that the original thesis that you had kind of doesn't really fit into this little nice <laughs> puzzle box that you built. So you have to make a judgment call on whether the emergent system is better or your original idea is better. And it's usually at the point where you don't know if the book is good at all. <laughs> yeah, that's usually where the, the, I usually have that existential crisis around 20,000 words. Or so. <laughs> Everyone does. Yeah, about 20k well, is when I when I bail or I stick with it. So, uh, so I wanted to ask, how do you how do you guys plan your books? I don't because Empire of Bones, really. I I don't plan. I write off the cuff. I when I start a book, I honestly okay. have very little idea where it's going to go. I may see a scene in advance, maybe two, certainly no further. Wow, huh. that's just crazy. Crazy talk. I make up the story as I go. I say, what would be fun to do here? And I do it. If I'm writing a standalone, uh -huh. usually that's the way it goes. Uh -huh. After I get through the first book of a series, however, I start putting on the constraints and it starts requiring more yeah. forethought. Yeah. And so you have to kind of keep the, Wow, I want to go play with the shiny. No, we can't play with that shiny. That's for another book. Uh, that is not in yeah, this yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. yeah I totally go new. play with the shiny. I run, I, into this, I run into this problem because I tried doing doing it sort of sort of purely. Let me just sit down and have fun. And somewhere around the around like the two hundred page, it had turned into this weird Wittgenstein thesis. This was the <laughs> AI. Thing, right, and you know, you have this god tier alien AI saying, All you know, saying, Let's play the herb, let's play the language game, and that it doesn't care about starships, your weapons mean nothing to me, but can you play the language game? Um, and I was like, Hang on, I wanted to write about people on a planet trying to build a tent. <laughs> How did this go wrong? And now I have to come back and rewrite everything to make it a lot smarter. I, I, I will works. be honest, Sarah. I, I do when I try starting writing a novel, mm -hmm. I try to have at least a goal in mind. You have and goals. I try to at least keep that goal <laughs> in mind. And about half the time, the goal has changed by the time I've reached the halfway point. But I do try to keep something in mind. I, I, I don't just write until it just peters off. I try to keep <laughs> achieving some type right. of closure. Right. <laughs> There, there's all these words you're using. I don't understand. I, um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not low key terrified now. <laughs> it's fun. What you're, can I say? You're, you're sailing into the abyss, and you're that one lunatic captain who sends his ship forth out into the gale and enjoys it. Yes, I am. Yes, you are. You absolutely are. I I'm just like. I, I think Paul and I are more like. Hmm. Clouds. Yeah, let's not do this today. <laughs> the experiment that I just did this last month is I decided I was going to write the next book. I've been using dictation to write for a couple of books now. Right, right. How and did that go? It's it's worked fine. I, I love doing it. I can't imagine going back to the keyboard for the first draft. Mm -hmm. But I went ahead and took my handheld recorder and started mm -hmm. walking through my neighborhood, just dictating the story without anything in front of me. Mm -hmm. Just going there. In 15 days, I wrote 75,000 words. Wrote. Wow. Yeah, wrote. Well, I mean, he got 75,000 so. It's going to take a little bit of cleaning up to, to get them there, but it's, it's an interesting experiment to see if you've got nothing else on your mind, how long can I walk and talk? Well, how do you do stuff like alliteration? And playing? It faded out. I couldn't hear you. How do you do stuff like alliteration and, and playing with words and sort of seeding different little wordplay touches here and there? I just so. insert myself into the characters and I say what they would say. I don't actually try to do wordplay. Right, 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 right. If it, if it happens, mm. it's, it's just luck on my part. People, people read what I write and say, it's amazing how you did this thing. And I'm like, I did this thing? <laughs> when did that happen? There's this thing. But this sounds really useful. I mean, I, I have um, a, a voice recorder. Um, I think this is Dragon, right? I think I should be able to. I use the that. Dragon version 15 Pro. 
and uh -huh. I use a little bitty cheap Sony recorder. Oh, okay. And I just oh. walk and I talk into it. And I have one of I, I found the secret to writing more words that way is mm -hmm. you write, you walk away from the house. It's, I got this advice from Kevin J. Anderson is you, you walk out. And by the time you finish doing whatever you're going to walk, you might as well record the same amount coming back because you've got to walk it anyway. <laughs> and it actually really works. It so really that, does. That's like saying you've got to Mordor, Frodo. Um, have you thought about the return journey? <laughs> and Sam might say, I don't think there is a return journey, Mr. Frodo. Damn it, my planning is horrible. I'm just a gardener, not a military campaigner. Screw each, you. each day that I was walking, I walked about three miles. Mm -hmm. I I do it in two trips, about 40 minutes mm -hmm. each. I'd walk out three quarters of a mile and come back. And those two trips um, out were 6,000 words roughly a piece. I have a very small problem in that I live next to the new Ministry of Defense, which is, uh, I think, the largest single military base in South Asia. They it's may frown upon available. you walking by with a recorder. Just say. Yes, yes. There are large numbers of people with all manner of remorseless pieces of metal just sort of standing there looking for things to point at. And I'd rather not be pointed at. So, Understood. yeah, no, maybe I, I can just walk around the house. Maybe so. I yeah. For a long time, I, I sat here and recorded into my microphone. I discovered that not looking at the screen makes me more productive. But plenty of people oh. do, right? Looking right. at the screen. Right, right. Wow. Okay. Okay. Terry's a weirdo. I am. Yeah. I, I, I do things differently. <laughs> I've always written differently than everybody else that I know. And it makes me happy. And I guess that's my secret to success is that I never tried to be someone else. I just be myself. Mm. Mm. Aww. Aww. That is... Um, you need to write a book of inspirational life quotes someday. Oh, God, no. Have you I can hardly imagine that. The show? You really want that out there? Come on. He could he could put one of his cats on the cow. It would sell. Oh, yeah. Everybody says we just need more cats in the show, and you know our, our subscriber counts will go through the roof. <laughs> yeah, I actually did, did want to ask you, why don't you have a cat on the show? We do have cats on the show all the time. All the time. They visit it's every time, just like many is visited. But But as a sort of permanent feature and not a bug. But it's not yeah. a bug. We don't consider it a bug. We just consider it life. I mean, they're they're just part of the it's show. Like I, I remember when Terry was rescuing that cat from the hurricane. Mm -hmm. Romeo. Was, yeah, your videos are all like, what's that week? Like, that was, to me, higher stake stuff than anything on Netflix. I wasn't sure that was going to work out well. <laughs> yeah. It was fancy. Yeah, and this is Really, a wild cat that had sort of gotten used to human life and so on. And I was like, wow, this is cutting edge drama. And he's such a nice person. And there's a cat involved. This is like everything I could want from the internet. There's a conspicuous lack of this on and, the show. And now he sits in my lap occasionally. So he's, it's been two years and he's, he's blended in fairly well. Uh, not wow. just lap, he's been on Terry's head before on this show. Not not Romeo. I, I, no, I, that I, is not I, happened. I, I envy this. The other one. I'm thinking the other one. Never mind. Mine. Um, we had an argument over who had the moral right to the last piece of chicken on my plate. I insisted it was mine. He insisted it was his. We had an argument. We haven't spoken to each other since. <laughs> yeah. When I was in the army years and years ago, thirty years ago, I had a a black cat then as well, and one of my friends decided that he was going to have chicken nuggets and he would go ahead and eat half of it and give the other half to the, to the cat. And one time he decided to just pop the whole thing in his mouth. The cat went after it. The cat said, no, oh, that is my piece of yeah, chicken. Yeah. You just took. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And very bad things happened afterward. <laughs> what happened? I really want to know that. I can't uh, imagine. He, he got that piece of chicken back because the other guy fell out of his chair. The chicken came loose. The cat won. You need to uh, get your mic closer. Yeah, I, I think this is a universal theme. The cat's winning. Terry Patchett used to say that you, they used to be gods. Uh, they just haven't forgotten this. You know, no, we I have believe not. It. Yeah. Have you seen uh, Love, Love, Death, or Sex, Death, and Robots? Love, Death, and Robots. Yes, I have. Uh, okay, the I've, cat episode that's in there? Yes, the first one. Yes, that, that basically got me hooked. Uh, and I, lo I love that 
you, you know, there seems to be so much investment in science fiction and fantasy from TV these days. Yeah. Like, uh, let's see what's out now. Love, Death and Robots came out, of course. But right now you have The Witcher, you have Watchmen, uh, The Expanse, and... The stories. What? Yeah, and then you've My got wife the... and I are watching the second season of Lost in Space, the redo on that. Oh, some yes. Of the, some of the ideas there are pretty interesting. Yeah, oh, yeah. Came out, right? Season two just came out on Christmas. Yeah. It did. That, that and I'm like out. starting episode eight tomorrow. I, I really like this because for the longest time it felt like like whenever we talked about science fiction and fantasy, it felt like like that nobody had heard of these things, nobody gave them. But now all of my I don't read science fiction and fantasy friends are now talking about the Marvel Universe, are now talking about Watchmen, are now, are now going, oh my god, Henry Cavill is gorgeous. That That's mostly the women. And <laughs> I'm going, hmm, fine. Uh, it, it's incredible because now it feels like science fiction and fantasy is becoming more and more mainstream and sort of an accepted part of life and readership and entertainment rather than this weird almost this ghettoized thing in a corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last year it was, it. Last year it was Altered Carbon that I was watching. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. How did you guys find that show? I loved like, it. Okay. 10,000 times better than the books. Okay, so I'm not, not alone in this. No, you are not. I yeah. got the audiobooks. I just haven't listened to them yet. Oh, don't I, listen to the third one. It sucks. The narrator should be shot. I read the... I read all three books, and then I had the same feeling. The first I felt was, okay, he had something interesting, this thesis of people wouldn't die if you came to a certain level of technology. And Harari talks about this, um, the historian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he wrote a brief history of um, of mankind. Oh, uh, uh, you, all, you all know Harari, like, like very famous name historian. is familiar, yes. Yeah, incredibly intelligent dude. Then he wrote a book called Homo Deus where he tried to predict what would happen. Um, and he pointed out that until now, all of our medical advances have been uh, reaching the theoretically high, I mean, the, the limit of a human lifespan. And obviously the next stage beyond that is to extend lifespan. And he points out that how technological change happens is basically how William Gibson described it. You know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So you find uh, the moment you put like the cap on wealth and the cap on power and control has always been the end of a human life. You take that end away, you end up with the ultimate control mechanism. So I was like, okay, Morgan's, you know, this is really interesting what he's doing here. But then it just peters out into yeah. the second and the third books just become this rather strange meandering, trying to be poetic stuff and it just dies and like it's so much intellectual promise here but where is it in the other books yeah the first well the first book just had that hook yeah it yeah. actually had that hook and then after that it was kind of like well where are we going with this exactly yeah um yeah. and it, it just didn't feel like the same the, the, the second and third books just did not feel like just that first. didn't feel the same right yeah, like but were, the they, show, the show just expanded on so much, though, and was so rich yeah. compared to the sparse, the sparseness, yeah, um, with which the the book is written, yeah. And it, and I, oh and I felt God, that the whole idea of beaming mercenaries over into other people's bodies is perfect because planetary warfare obviously ships take time to arrive, but you can now send people your own operatives. At the speed of light to another planet, get Master. there before the yeah. I mean, this is like yeah. I mean, this is revolutionary. This is like really interesting stuff. You could change military strategy. I was like, okay, let me, let me get to the good stuff, and, and it and, just wasn't there. Yes, it just wasn't there. And then at Alter Carbon, they or the the TV series, they changed it around because now the person he kept mentioning as having taught everybody yeah. or whatever yeah. the name is, yeah. And uh, her dying, and that was all the legends. And it's like, well, in the in the series, they made that actually a big part of the show, as opposed to just being yes. kind of mentioned here and there. Yes, Virginia Vidora, mm -hmm. I think, was the name he put, gave to her in the books, and they sort of merged Vidora and Quelkist, uh, Quelchrist Falconer in no, the Falconer. series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know, like, it felt like Cyberpunk was coming back. I was really excited for it. 
Yeah, I think there's I, been, I feel like it is like cyberpunk is mm-hmm. undergoing some kind of I, renaissance. I think I wish I think it would. It it's been a long time since I've read Neuromancer and, and books like that. It it doesn't feel it feels like it appeared and it was wonderful and then it just seemed to peter away. It just depends on how you were uh, how you define cyberpunk. It, it I think it stopped yeah. being I think it stopped being mainstream so to speak, but the mm. facets of it are showing up everywhere. And especially, I mean, even in like, you know, shows like CSI or whatever else, um, you're seeing that kind of hacker Absolutely. mentality being used. You're seeing Absolutely. people talking about this. And then yep. there are idiots like me who are writing about, you know, sentient intelligences and moving on with that. I think it's all kind of coming together. What's left out of it is Molly the Assassin mm-hmm. right now. Yes. When Molly the Assassin <laughs> enters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's going to be a completely different animal. On the it's, fantasy it, side of it, yeah. the magicians has been the one that's kept my eye. Really? Yes. Okay. I really enjoyed what he did with the books. I haven't read them. I need to read. Them. I haven't read the books. I just watched the series on Netflix. Oh, so if you read the books, it's very clear that he's parodying Narnia. And I, I, I grew believe up it. reading C.S. Lewis and Narnia. The, the, you, see the, the yeah, you see the connotations, right? And it's yes. almost. Word for word, you can see that this fillery that's constructed is this dark inverse mirror of the childhood fantasy, and everybody's kind of fucked up. And I love that. <laughs> Not only that, but everything's out of time. Yes. Like you're yes. traveling through time, and it just keeps warping back and forth, and you're like, what the fuck happened to causality, you bozos? What yes. are you doing? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Why is the space time continuum completely collapsed with the crap you people are doing? With the stuff that you're doing, yeah. One of the things that I noticed with the, the television series of it, anyway, is a number of the secondary characters that that were not very likable at the beginning of it were allowed to grow and change in ways that they, in a lot of means, eclipsed mm-hmm. the primary character. And I thought that was wonderful. It happens in the books as well, because the primary character, and I suppose why I feel why I like that, uh, time of writing is the primary character is an asshole. He's a bit of a narcissist. He is emotionally disconnected he's from emo. everything. Around. He's emo. Yes, he's he's emo without the style of being. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, uh, emo without the dress sets. Yeah, and he doesn't really change. Like through the books, he just becomes progressively more nihilistic, and then sort of there's a little bit of redemption. But in general, um. Quentin as a character is this nihilistic guy. And it's the people around him that really grow and mature. Like Penny, for example. Um, What I really liked in the series was that Penny was given a lot of flavor and character that he doesn't really have in the books. Uh, I probably shouldn't spoil it, but it's nice to see, you know, that, like you said, that even at a starting level, they've added so much more complexity and maturity to that character. Yeah, it's fun to see. It's like, uh, like like Terry was saying, would you yeah. see that kind of deal where Quentin is the? He's just the ske- He's just the skeleton. Everything else is built upon. Yes. My yes. wife told me that she thought he wasn't. That was that wasn't his story. That was her opinion after watching the show. Is that it was not Quentin's story. I don't think it is Quentin's story. It isn't, uh, and that was my reading of it as well. Because if you are parodying Narnia, you're parodying the hero myth. Because all of these things are effectively um, Joseph Campbell, like Hero of a Thousand Faces, the the single myth. Um, If you're parodying that, then the best way to, the best possible way to do it is to set up a hero and then have him fail expectations at every single go while everybody else gets their shit together and moves on with the plot. (laughs) I think that was a very deliberate choice on the author's part. I think that was very smart. But again, I may be analyzing more than there's actually there, but I, I think that was the intent. Do you know proper parody, not just in terms of the content in there, but in terms of the structure? Yes. Another uh, big that. thing in fantasy that's coming out, it's in book side anyway, is mm-hmm. um, Jim Butcher has finally got a publication date for his next Dresden Files. Novel. Yes, 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 yes. I, I am waiting for that. I'm glad that I know his life has been terrible for the last few years, and I'm yeah. glad it's looking up a little bit. Yeah. The guy seems to have gone through a pretty rough patch. Yeah, really yeah. rough pass, and that's that's hard to create through. Yeah, so I, I feel well, sorry. I for mean, him. thankfully, his his fan base is there, right? Because I was in an anthology with him recently, and like 
it, it's selling well, it, it was massively popular. All the reviews are like, I'm here for the Jim Butcher story. I don't give a shit about anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's like, I think one review that mentions like me and a few others by name. It's like, everybody else is like, I'm here for Jim Butcher. Right. Everybody just move away. That's it. But I mean, his fan base is there. There's extraordinarily loyal people who are extraordinarily loyal to the Dresden universe. Um, yeah. What are the really, there's a lot of, um, I know, but do you guys read a lot of Chinese science fiction? I don't. No. Um, Ch- Chen Kuifen. Uh, Kuifen. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the Q correctly. Um, rather interesting book called Waste Tides. There's a lot of really good Chinese science fiction coming out. I mean, it's sort of been watching the two. Like for me, I was like, I'm here in the middle. And there's this Southeast Asian metro. So we're trying to cobble a sort of scene together. But there's the US, which has an extraordinary established scene, tradition, ritual, you know, Twitter fights and so on and so forth. And then there's China, which basically kind of for us, like uh, for a lot of the science fiction I grew up reading was Artsy Clark, like the British line. And then there was stuff translated from Russia and a few propaganda stuff from China. And the Russian and Chinese stuff was generally either com- communist propaganda or things that were very clever and trying to subvert it and get past the censor boards. And a Slav Lem first. Yes, Lem, absolute, right? Lem Solari. So I was like, oh, wow, right. And uh, the brothers Tugatsky. So uh, it was sort of reading that. And then, you know, Russia and China just basically just vanished from the science fiction scene. And then until. 2012, as in my in my head, there was just stuff coming from the US. There was the UK. Um, there was some interesting stuff being done in um, uh, people like you know the guy who wrote Metro 2033. Okay. I just yeah, looked yeah, at yeah. that actually. The the audiobook is in the uh, two for one sale on Audible right now. I just just <laughs> it's, passed it's by a, today. It's a good book, and it uh, and he made the universe open to other writers like okay that's that's a very interesting non-zero sum model um but china basically didn't exist and then in 2012 you had the three body problem coming out mm-hmm. shishin lu and shishin lu is a very interesting character you know blue collar engineer writes this book that to me is like as as a as a fun book i wouldn't read it as a fun book but the mathematics in that book is oh, just bloody brilliant. So he's describing an absolutely brilliant mathematical problem that you know, all of us are fascinated with. And it's like the Chinese government sort of looked around and went, this thing called science fiction, we must have it. <laughs> and since then, it's just exploded because I have a lot of the, the writers, the academics and people um, on my friends list conferences are popping up out of nowhere journals are popping up out of nowhere academics in science fiction are literally like the fields are just being created left right and center university collaborations all this uh they were apparently looked around and gone um uh i think kai Fuli, the guy who wrote ai superpowers um who used to be at um google microsoft mm-hmm. and now he is he's um he's one of China's AI experts. Uh, he, I think, he was the guy who pointed out that when he talked to engineers in the West, the one thing that they had in common, the Silicon Valley people, the hardcore engineers, all of them mentioned like he found absolutely he or somebody else found absolutely no, um, nothing in common with regards to age. Uh, some things in regard to where they grew up, education levels, uh, family background, and so on. But the biggest indicator was whether they had read science fiction mm. uh, as a child. And that was a sort of an inspiration he found for so many fundamental technologies, not the apps and, and you know, fly by the night crap, but fundamental stuff like voice over IP. And they took that insight back. And it's like, there's an, China is terrifying and beautiful in how fast it can react to things when it decides to. So it's like overnight they've gone boom. And now there's a Chinese science fiction scene there. And there's books coming out of it. And people like Ken Lu are doing fantastic translations. And it's brilliant for me because uh, you see little touches that just go, yes, okay, I, I'm familiar with this. Like, for example, uh, Chen Kuifan wrote about this 
mountain that is essential this this sorry this island that's basically this giant trash collection and processing operation and it's all done by humans because machines are expensive why would you waste a good robot on this humans are cheap right that is the kind of thinking that you're going to see from india and china for me that that's where you're going all oh, right right wonderful you know because usually the narrative is automation will come in robots will do all this work and the humans will sit back and that's a very western narrative here we're going what's the value of a human life Hell, robots are expensive. Paint jobs are expensive. <laughs> and you see little touches like the one robot, one scrap metal robot is hung with little fetishes, little Buddha charms. Oh, God. And it's this, it's this military robot, and there are these lovely little touches there. And I'm like, yes, I, I really want to see that. There's That's a lot really of social commentary there. Yeah. Wow. Science me, fiction has been I filled think. with, yeah, filled with yeah. all kinds of subversive ideas. It'll be interesting to see how science fiction develops where the sensors are watching well you do know that they're they're putting together tv series now because i'm seeing them pop up on netflix absolutely and from if you china read and their, india and if you read their policy documents a lot of what they're doing in real life is a lot more science fiction than most of the science fiction we think of like uh i have this weird thing where like saw my facebook feed whenever i say china is going <laughs> um little break and the other half is going yeah uh, because, for example, we were looking at what they're doing for climate change. Because, you know, like 40% of China is running out of water. Um, so they've gone, okay, we're running out of water. Let us build a 1,400 mile pipe that ferries water from one half of the country to the other. Okay, cool. This climate change thing is happening. We're going to build a city and it will be a prototype, a green city. So they have built literally. Like I've seen their plans, I've seen the architecture plans. They're building a city that will be integrated with a million species of trees. With, sorry, with a million trees, it's become a hundred thousand species or something. Um, all the buildings have been designed from scratch to have trees in and around them, like actually part of the building itself, right? And they're building this grill, this Lushan green city. They've just gone ahead and said, "All right, cool, a city that can house at least a million people. Let's do it." Is and, this the one I think that I've seen that they're building it all, the entire city, everything, no one has moved in yet? Oh, so no, they do They do quite a lot of that. That's um, a different okay. one. And every, yeah, those are called the ghost cities. And it is a really interesting thing. Everybody laughs at those uh, until they start working uh, because there's this very famous case. Of, like, if you look at historically what's happened to those ghost construction, they build the infrastructure and then people spend a while laughing at them for being idiots. And then millions of people move in, and it becomes a thriving city. So yeah, that I'm, I'm not laughing at it. I, I believe that it's, I yeah, believe yeah. That it's something that's going to work. Yeah, I'm not laughing at it at all. Yeah, yeah, They're actually being very smart about this because if you take large mega cities in, say, Southeast Asia, in South Asia, with um, Delhi, um, grows is tw 27 million people now. Um, somewhere like 600,000 people uh, just just you know, just keep getting added to the system every single year. Um, it's unplanned growth. So what happens is something like something out of William Gibson, <laughs> where you have all these shanties sprawl. and you have, yes, you have the urban sprawl. Uh, and, and it is effectively that. So the sprawl is an economic enterprise. There's, there's all sorts of economic activity, cities as a f driver of economic activity, cool, that's happening, but it's so unregulated that the government can't provide services to the interior. So non-state actors then start taking on function of the state, like the legal monopoly on violence. All government is built on that, right. saying we have the right to do violence to you if you violate these laws. Other people do not have the right. That's why we have police, army, all these things. But then non-state actors can take on those pieces. So what you end up with is an entity with extraordinary political power because of all the population there and voting rights. But it is kind of like its own little micro-government unto itself. China has actually looked at that and gone, let's control all the infrastructure. Let's make sure it goes exactly where we want it to. And let's do this 10 years in advance. It's the kind of long-term thinking I wish that other countries had, honestly. Yeah, I think, we don't do I that think that that's kind of brilliant, thing. actually. Yeah. We don't yeah. do that kind of thing. Yeah. Either. That sounds like communism or something. <laughs> but we, but we, it's weird, right? We've lost this. Like the world as a whole has lost this kind of long-term thinking. The United States never fucking had it. No, you guys did have it. No, we didn't. No, you did. Maybe oh, not to that range. I don't all know. Of we, 
we all got here we got here and we have been fucking up everything from from east coast to west without a you goddamn put, thought about what we were laying down you put a man on the moon and that, yes. that is the kind of stuff that takes generational thinking that takes oh. long-term thinking that does and yeah. we were motivated to do it but if you look at us now it, there's none of that there because there's everything is so split. The corporations own yeah. everything, and there are yeah, other yeah, yeah. corporations left here that actually Absolutely. seem to give a yeah. shit about what America that America goes forward into. Other you've just countries. pressed Paul's hot button. No, it's just, it's just <laughs> no, 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 no. I completely agree. China, with you. China is able to move the way it is because Chinese are China. China is full of Chinese folks. Period. Mm. End of story. They're mm. trying to go toward one goal. Once they get moved that way in America, you got 50 fucking different countries trying to fly under the same banner of assholes that are in Washington, D.C. And everybody has different ideas about what should be done, mm -hmm. who should do what and who gets the kickbacks. Therefore, trying to get more than one state to focus on one problem is almost impossible. Is, trying yeah. to get 50 of them. Yeah, yeah. Is not just impossible. Same, but same thing absurd. in India. Same thing in India. Right. You have. Right vast amounts of land and what used to kind of be seven kingdoms because India did not exist before the British Raj happened. They basically right. said, okay, we're going to lump all these things together and for administrative purposes, we'll call this the British Raj. That's exactly India. how Germany worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Germany didn't but, exist. But no, it, it's interesting because when, when we talk policy like long-term planning and thinking and public infrastructure and so on, I find that the Europeans have a much better handle on this stuff. And I'm wondering if it, if there is a historical precedent for that, because they're known for building, you know, some of the churches and the iconic architecture built many hundreds of years ago. Those are multi generational projects. So they're insanely gorgeous things by today's standards, but those mm -hmm. are multi generational projects. People laid the foundation stones, knowing that they're going to die, and praying that their descendants would someday lay the, uh, you know, put in the glass, and that, and that's that kind of yeah. thinking is what they had i i'm actually seeing a lot of traces of that in how they do policy and this very measured approach of we're not going to react to it right now we're going to think about this and we'll come back to you with a great solution right and and then we'll we'll try and get everyone to do this it's it's rather interesting they're doing a lot of things i don't agree with like gdpr but it's this level of long-term thought that i only see in china elsewhere yeah, the Japanese used to have it, not uh -huh. anymore. And uh, really, I don't think they do. I don't know if, enough if they, to have an opinion. If they were doing long term planning, I don't think their population would be going negative as fast as it is. I don't think you can actually plan for that because, you know, you know, like all populations in sort of in what we call the first world, the developed category, all populations are trending towards the negative. Except in Israel, so there's two uh, two point one births per woman is the constant, generally accepted re requirement to hold a population constant. Uh, all developed countries fall below. It's it's a known thing that as a country uh, gets more and more developed, as people start because reproduction. For example, if you, if you think of why my mother had me, and and she's like quite open about this, she had me as a form of insurance because if you're poor and you're in a third world country. Uh, you, you can't save. You live day to day. So you have children who will uh, provide for you in your old age. But uh, how, the higher you go up the socioeconomic ladder, the more you can provide for yourself, the more you can save, the more social amenities you have, the more social services you have around you. So a lot of that stuff becomes needless. Now, instead of you know being part of the system of churning out other little systems, you can go on and have dreams and live a life of your own kind of thing. This happens. Uh, I think Japan, I don't think population count can necessarily be counted as something against Japan. Well, it's not a matter of, of something against it. It's just a matter of it seems like, the um, to me anyway, the, the, the culture is moving in a way that I think has been self-destructive for a while. And I think that, that uh, some of that is reflected in it. How so? Because How so? of the way the... the um, my understanding from what I've read is that the, the culture has a split, which is Japanese women are getting to the point now or have gotten to the point where they do not want to live with their mother-in-law. They don't want to have a mother-in-law to live with. 
therefore they're not getting married. Therefore there's having some breakdowns in, um, even, uh, uh, physical intimate contact because now all these things are done virtually. That's the same problem we're having in the United States as well. Yes, but it's this is being driven by a different cultural deal, which Maybe is so, but the end result's the same. The end result is the same, except that now it's, it's shattering on levels. It, I think where there are people that just play maybe stay their entire lives in the house, and you're saying that's here. Yeah, so, so they're right. called they're called otakus. Um, otakus. Yeah, but but the otaku phenomenon has existed for a long time, and doesn't Gibson have a book called Otaku? Hmm. Doesn't Gibson have a book called Otaku? It, uh, Idoro. Idoro. Okay, never mind. Yes. Uh, idols. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Gibson kind of called call Japanese culture in that one. Uh, the thing is, like, A, I'm going to preface this by saying that I don't know enough to make a detailed and thorough analysis and say this may be what's happening. Uh, but from what I've seen, I mean, a lot of... See, a lot of what you read and a lot of what you see is from the Western press, which loves nothing more than to exoticize and <laughs> blow a story out completely out of proportion for the clicks and the reads. So I have a default level of skepticism coming into that. And secondly, a lot of what you read written by that, you should read the Japan Times. Um, like this news publication I read daily. Um, they don't really have a lot of, like they're not, concerned about this. this is a fact of life this is you know they they're not panicking over this whereas something like i don't know the washington post or whatever well, what what i thought was the, interesting about it though is the fact that they invited koreans to come live there they're inviting chinese to come live there so the germans in berlin after the second world war and so on they had this period where they invited um, turks I think to come over and settle and essentially provide much of the labor force. So we will give you citizenship. We come, come here, and that worked out fantastically for them. I mean, Berlin is an absolutely cosmopolitan place where you can have one euro kebabs here, and then go stare at like 18th century cathedrals. And there's probably a sex party happening somewhere in a corner. And there's probably some very uh, like grandiose design scheme going on right next to it. It's, um, I think this will work out. Um, I think Japan will actually have a strategic advantage because the biggest fear rolling into the next 10 years is automation. And people are terrified of jobs being taken away, robots, we're seeing something, what the World, uh, World Economic Forum calls the fourth the industrial revolution. There's a little bit of faff on their definition of it, but that's that's a big fear, you know. Like a lot of the, for example, in Southeast Asia, South and Southeast Asia, a lot of the uh, industries are built on manufacturing jobs. A lot of those are going to be cut out if machine learning and advances in robotics go the way we think they will. Japan has an absolute advantage in that. It's not going to have a large unemployed mass of people uh, sitting around going, shit, what do we, we do? need jobs. Yeah, like the government needs to give us jobs. That's not going to happen. Yeah, you're probably right about that. I think they've actually worked out, I don't know whether by accident or whether by design, they've worked out a slightly more sustainable way of life, honestly. <laughs> high hope, consumption. Hope that's, high yeah, well, high, high consumption. High, yeah, high consumption, high income, but resilient to a lot of the shocks that are going to sweep through our societies in the next 10 years. Hmm. I'm or maybe a giant squid would land on them and they'll all Or, die. you know, yeah. What do I know? Yeah. <laughs> Godzilla comes up out of the ocean and kills us all. That's all. It, it could happen. We're sci-fi well, writers, could, damn it. It could, it, it could happen. It could happen. We could, could just launch a giant squid at someone. <laughs> you know, I think that's a great place to bring this conversation to a close. <laughs> Before it goes on for another three hours. <laughs> because Absolutely. we could talk forever. Because we uh, talk, and it's really fun talking with you. And two of us have to go to bed because I have it, to wake up. It's only like midnight hours. now. I have to wake yeah. up in five, five or six hours. Why do you have to wake up in five or six hours? Because that's when the the team of developers I'm managing are wake up on in Serbia. And get to ah, work. okay. I, I don't envy. Actually, you. they got oh. to work about ten minutes ago, but I have to be on then <laughs> after they've gotten through their shit for the day, and then they can tell me what they need. So, 
<laughs> well, that's fair. Thank you so much for having me on, gentlemen. It is a pleasure. Where can folks find you? Um, Yudonje.com or on Amazon. Uh, uh, I can send you my links. And yes, that would be good. Yeah, because I don't fancy spelling it out. And I don't think a lot of people would just tune off. Um, and, on, and on Facebook as well. I'm rather active on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Yudonje. Again, send you the links. That's okay. mostly where I live. Awesome. It's a real pleasure talking to you. It, you've opened our eyes to a lot of things going on outside the little <laughs> bubble we live in. Well, thank you for letting me ramble on. Oh, well, shit. That's what we do, man. That's what the show is. That is what we do. <laughs> that's the whole show. We should just rename it the 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 Dead Ramble Honors or something. I don't know. That would totally work. That would absolutely work. And I'm, I, hey, I'm looking forward to listening to the podcast. Oh, cool. Then, then you'll find out what you said. Yeah. Or, yes, and then I'll have that moment where I realize, oh crap, I sound like a pillock on radio. I don't know how I edit it. <laughs> right. Editing is better be nice to me. I can do things in the editing that, room. That sounded dirty. I think that we really should leave that alone right now because <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, I don't know why I just pictured an army of goats running endlessly across an infinite expanse, just charging with RPG-7 strapped to their backs. I'm not entirely sure why, but when you said I can do things, that's perfect. Um, yeah. I am wow. totally going to remember that. <laughs> I think I need you can do that, Paul. You have a question or a comment about this show <laughs> or herds of RPG wearing goats? Dude, Please, you know, everyone, have- use that in your novels now. You can send us an email at show at DeadRobotSociety.com. You can tweet me at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. You can find us on Facebook at the listeners of the Dead Robot Society Facebook group. You can go to YouTube.com slash DRS podcast to see our ugly mugs and and hear us. And, and you can see Yuda and you can see cats and things like that. Oh, crap. I should have put on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Too late now. We have to thank our wonderful host, Pod Hoster, who makes all 14 bazillion episodes of the Dead Robot Society available for your ear holes. And if you want to support the show, and why wouldn't you? You can find us at patreon.com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to uh, uh, exclusive content like the rambling pre-interview, post-interview stuff that is bound to happen. And at the $10 level, you get your name read because you're all special and stuff. And our $10 patrons are Andrew Smallwood, J.D. Barker, Tony L. Joy, Veronica Jaguer, Current Project Ruin Terra for Terry Mixon. Hmm. Yeah, Veronica, set your sights higher. Kelson, Isabel Cushy, Rick Shaw, Lisa Slack, Nathan Cosby, Cheryl Winters, Tracy Bodine, Devin Lee, Drew Bernardi, Chris Winder, and J.R. Handley. Thank you very much, folks. Indeed. Thank you, folks. And thank you for joining us, Yuta. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it was a blast. Thank you for having me, guys. We'll have to have you on again because, well, you know, we just didn't I'm, talk enough the first time. I'm completely up for it. And <laughs> I, I apologize if I went on for a little bit of monologuing in there. Uh, you're fine. No worries. Fine. There. You know how much your, your comment on Goats with RPGs threw Paul off? <laughs> I actually started the show and should have ended it, but you threw him off so bad he felt the need to end it himself. <laughs> and I, like, I nope, sat here nope, and let him do nope, it. You're getting this guy out of you. I, I was afraid it was going to get scarier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, goodbye, folks. <laughs>